Well, this week and next, we will bring our study of the second chapter of 2 Thessalonians to a conclusion, and we'll take a brief break from our study of the book of 2 Thessalonians as we enter into the summer months, and we'll turn our attention back as we have uh, last summer to the book of Exodus. We'll be studying the book of Exodus for a bit, and our elders also will be teaching us this summer, uh, continuing a series that Dalton began a few weeks ago on living out the, the attributes of God and how those attributes affect us day in and day out. This second chapter of Second Thessalonians is intended to settle down shaken hearts, hearts that have been agitated by a wrong understanding of current events and how they relate to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in judgment. There is this kind of temptation that exists in all of us, and I think we see this regularly, this temptation to look at what's going on around us that's opposed to God and opposed to the truth of God and begin to wonder if we're not living in the days of God's judgment. You hear this at times when, when someone, uh, especially some spiritual authority or leader, hears of a natural disaster or there's something, some kind of plague hitting our world, and they say, this is the judgment of God. We're living under the judgment of God, as if to to say that we are now experiencing the wrath of God because of what we see in our our current circumstances. Now, we know that God does use personal suffering and cultural opposition at times as a means of disciplining His children, as if to wean our fingers off of the world and to take our heart away from the things of this world so we would love Christ more purely. He will use painful circumstances to do that, but that's not His wrath. That's His fatherly love. God does allow the unbelieving world and even the devil himself to have their way in some limited degree and in various seasons, which in the end simply builds the reservoir of God's justice that will be poured out in an overwhelming wave of wrath on the world. But we're not going to experience that wrath. We're not the children of His wrath. Divine discipline, present persecution, these are not the clear signs that we are in the future day of God's wrath. And as we've seen in our study of this chapter, someone in the church in Thessalonica had wrongly convinced this young church that their present sufferings were signs that they were under the period of the final wrath of God, and this had them concerned What this false teacher was saying about their current events was evidently something contrary to what the Apostle Paul had taught these believers about what would happen in the end and how their salvation would relate to those events. As we have seen, they were confused about the coming of Jesus. And the coming of Jesus includes several phases and several events. It includes the gathering together of those in Christ Jesus to meet the Lord in the air, what is oftentimes referred to as the rapture. It's referred to in chapter 2, verse 1. It's taught on more extensively in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. That rapture then unleashes another event and another season in the coming of the Lord in all the events and phases of the coming of the Lord called the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord then is the day of God's outpouring of judgment and righteous wrath on those on the earth who have opposed Him. The day of the Lord is then completed in a final phase, in a final event, when Jesus appears and returns to the earth with His transformed people, overcoming those who have opposed God and assuming His rightful place of reigning over the earth until every enemy has been finally conquered and the whole universe is then given over to God the Father in a final consummation of all things and the state of eternity in God's full presence begins forever and ever. These are the events related to the coming of the Lord. And the Thessalonians were being told evidently that the rapture had already taken place, 
or it had somehow happened spiritually that they would not experience it as they were expecting and that they were now in the day of God's wrath. And all of the suffering they were going through was the sign that they were under God's judgment in those final days of God's wrath. And Paul writes to say essentially, you know these aren't the days of God's wrath. You know the events as I've taught you, and he gives further clarification here. You know this can't be the day of God's wrath because you haven't seen the apostasy that he refers to in verse 3, and you've not seen the revelation of the man of lawlessness. That has not happened yet. But there's another reason why they should not think that their present circumstances was the future wrath of God. And it has to do with the safety of their salvation. It's found in verses 13 to 15. What we need to do is clarify how our salvation relates to the coming wrath of God. What Paul teaches us here is that our salvation actually will preclude God's people, this side of the day of the Lord, it will preclude His people from actually entering into the day of the Lord. And that has a number of effects on us. That's what we've begun to look at. What is the effect that our salvation's safety has on us as it keeps us from entering into the day of the Lord? We began looking at this last week. Verses 13 to 15 indicate that there are six effects of salvation's safety from God's wrath And the fact is that these truths, these effects of the safety of our salvation should actually settle us down. It should settle our hearts, keep us from being agitated so that when we read of what's going on in our world, we're not upset by these things. We we trust that God is still in control and He's moving all things towards their intended conclusion and we are actually safe from the wrath of God. What are these six effects of salvation safety from the wrath of God that settle our heart? We began last week looking at the first one in verse 13, salvation safety produces gratitude to God. Produces gratitude to God. That's how Paul begins verse 13, we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord. It is a gratitude that is necessary, consistent, God-centered, personal, Christ-centered, And you will have that kind of gratitude when you fully comprehend the kind of safety that you have from the day of the Lord and from God's wrath. You will be grateful. The second effect of salvation safety from God's wrath is that salvation safety is determined by God. This should settle our hearts. We're giving thanks. Why? Notice verse 13 again, because God has chosen you for salvation. That is profound. He has not chosen you for wrath. He has personally, specifically chosen you for salvation. You're not going through His wrath. He has personally chosen you. That's incredible safety. As Paul would say in Romans 8, if God is for us, who could be against us? He has chosen you. The third effect of salvation safety from God's wrath that should settle our hearts is that salvation safety anticipates the abundance of God. It anticipates the abundance of God. It's found in the phrase, <clears throat> God has chosen you as first fruits for salvation. Some of you in your versions, it reads from the beginning, but the better reading is first fruits for salvation. It's a reference to the Old Testament concept of an offering of gratitude at the beginning of the harvest time, promising an abundance to come. In other words, God did not choose you to enter into a time of wrath, which is not abundance. He chose you as first fruits to see and experience the abundance of the salvation of God. That's how you should see your salvation. We're in the era of abundant salvation, not wrath. The fourth effect of salvation safety from God's wrath 
is that salvation safety is accomplished by the means of God. And we looked at that last week. How does God accomplish this ultimate glorifying saving work? Through two different means, holiness from the Spirit, through sanctification by the Spirit. He creates in you a holiness, a devotion to God by the work of the Holy Spirit in you that brings you into final salvation. And He uses faith in the truth. Your confident belief in the saving message of God brings you into final salvation, not wrath. That brings us this morning to the fifth and the sixth effects of salvation, safety from God's wrath that should settle our hearts. Number five, salvation safety guarantees the goal of God. I want you to see this and rejoice in it. Verse 14, salvation safety guarantees the goal of God. It was for this he called you through our gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is a profound statement. Verse 14 is another reason why I'm confident that the aspect of salvation that Paul is referring to in this chapter is not initial salvation or the process of sanctification, but final salvation. It's what he has in mind. God has chosen you, and now God has called you so that you would gain the glory. That is the goal of God, that you would gain the glory of Jesus Christ. Notice this language. It was for this he called you through our gospel. The word called is very important in the theology of the Apostle Paul for salvation. It is the word that Paul typically uses to refer to salvation. It's a synonym for salvation. He saved you or he called you. It parallels the idea in verse 13 that He chose you. God has chosen you, and He has also called you. You believe because you were called. He chose you, and that is His calling on your life. This is not a reference to the general call of God to everyone. Many are called, few are chosen. This is not the general call. This is what we call the effectual call. This is the call that actually takes effect, the saving call of God. If you're a Christian, it's because you are called of God into salvation. He made it effective. It's a term that he's used a number of times in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians to talk of our salvation. 1st Thessalonians 2.12 Again, it speaks to the goal of our salvation, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God, listen to this, worthy of the God who calls you into His own kingdom and glory. Your salvation brings you into the kingdom and the glory of God. That's a calling of God. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, God has not called us for the purpose of impurity. He didn't save us. He didn't call us effectively into salvation so that we would live in impurity, but in sanctification, in holiness. Your calling, your salvation is a holy calling. 1 Thessalonians 5.24 refers to faithful is He, faithful is God who calls you, saves you. He will bring it to pass. This word called is a reference to salvation. And we know that especially in this text because notice, He called you through what? Through what did He call us? Our gospel. This is a saving calling. Through our gospel. Now, by Paul saying it's our gospel, he doesn't mean that he wrote it, that he came up with it, that it originated with him. It's our gospel because it's the message that we specifically preach to you. We brought you this saving message. In distinction from the message that other teachers are bringing you, this gospel message actually is the calling of God on your life. When God calls someone into salvation, that saving calling does not come 
through any other means than the gospel. Have you ever had conversations with someone and you're talking to them about, how do you know that you're a Christian? How do you know that the calling of God is on your life? I've heard a number of responses to that. And there's people who say, well, I, I've had these, these wonderful experiences. Like, God has answered my prayer, so I know that I'm saved. Or I had a dream, and I just know that it was God. Or there was this amazing experience that I had, and I can't explain it. I just felt something come over me. I've heard this many times. I just felt something come over me, this warm experience. I know it was the hand of God. That's not the calling of God, friends. You say, well, what is that? I have no idea. I'm not going to call it into question. I'm not going to say that it didn't happen. But it's not the gospel. A dream is not the gospel. An experience is not the gospel. Answered prayer is not the gospel. The gospel is a message. The message is the means of God to bring you into salvation. So, friends, I just want to say, you might have had very amazing experiences. It could be, though it's not guaranteed that it is, the activity of God. You can't trust those things because they are not the message of salvation. The gospel, that is how the God who made heaven and earth, including all humanity, to bear his image is offended by humanity's rebellion. Yet God in his mercy takes on human nature, satisfies his own righteousness in the person of Christ who obeys him explicitly, and Christ then dies as a substitute and acceptable sacrifice to God for humanity's sin, and all who trust in that work alone and believe in it and turn from their sin have the hope of future salvation. That is the gospel. That is the sum total of where all of the Bible is going. And if you hear that message and believe it and are transformed by it, you are those whom God has called. But I want you to see what this ultimate aim of the saving call of God is. And I want us to meditate on that for just a bit. It was for this that he called you through our gospel. What did he call us to? What is the end goal of this saving call through the gospel? that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. The future goal to our initial salvation, when you enter into salvation, the future goal of that is to enter into glorification, final salvation, the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you read about the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is a reference to our future final glorification. It's the same idea that we find in Romans chapter 8 verse 30 when Paul rattles off this litany of theological profound truth that we hang on to. Those whom he predestined, he also called. Who's the called? The predestined. Are all of the called predestined? According to this verse, they are. Those whom he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he also, what's the end? Glorified. Everyone predestined is to be glorified. Everyone called will be glorified. Everyone justified is called, will be glorified. They've been predestined. It all works together. What is it that we've fallen short of? that our sin points to. All have sinned and fall short of what? The very thing that God destines you to achieve in salvation, the glory of God. You're absent of the glory of God. Salvation guarantees that you will gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to ask and answer some questions here about this so that we make sure that we have our mind wrapped around it well. What is it that the gospel of God calls us to that we have fallen short of? The glory of Christ. Now, in this context, in this chapter, 
What is the glory of Christ contrasted to? The day of the Lord. Do you see that? The day of the Lord is not the day of God's glory. It is the day of His wrath. He has chosen you not to go into the day of the Lord, but to enter into the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's different. But let me ask and answer a couple of questions about that. What do we mean when we refer to the glory of Jesus? I want you to think about that with me. What is the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ referring to? Well, in short, we could try to define the glory of Jesus as the display of the brilliant perfections of the Son of God. It's just a short way to describe the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is the display, glory inherently, by definition, has some kind of mindset that it's on display, and glory is connected to brilliance. It is the display of the brilliance of the perfections of the Son of God. I want you to think of that with me. Humanity, in the very beginning when God created man and woman, why did He create them? We know that He created the entire animal world after their kind to represent themselves as if the animal world shows their creatureliness. What was humanity created to display? God. We were created in the image of God, not to display ourselves, not to display just our creatureliness. The goal of God in the creation of humanity humanity was to display Himself. What does that mean? To display His perfections and to spread those, be fruitful and multiply, means to spread the image bearers of God across the earth so we would, as a whole human race, display the perfections of God across the world. Adam displayed the glory of God in his humanity perfectly, as perfect humanity in the beginning. When he sinned, sin marred the display of those perfections. Sin marred the display of all that God had created humanity to be, to image God. So this is interesting, when you begin to read through the Old Testament and you begin to see these leaders and significant human beings emphasized like Adam or Moses or David or Joseph or many others, some of the prophets, every time that you begin to see in their life some display of God-centeredness, you're seeing them to display the image of God as it was intended, but every time you see them display that, even really good guys like David. You can't help but think about David's life without thinking about his sin. But he's imaging God as God intended him to do many times to say, this is what humanity is stretching for, but it's like, I don't know if you've ever seen one of those Byzantine mosaics in the sixth century or so, those, all of those little tiny Uh, tiles put together to form a perfect, intricate picture of Christ, and yet it's marred by soot from all of the atmosphere and the ages together. That's kind of like the picture of humanity. We're trying to show the glory of God, but we're filled with this soot from the smog of our own sin. We need it to be wiped away so we see the brilliant display of that perfect formed image. It was Isaiah who actually saw a vision of the glory of Jesus in Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted with the train of his robe filling the temple, and seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, because they couldn't bear to look on this glorious image. It was too brilliant. With two he covered his feet, as if to say we're unclean to be in the presence of such a holy being. With two he flew as if to serve this glorious, 
person on the throne. And one called out to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. That's the vision Isaiah said. And Jesus said, actually in John chapter 12, verse 41, that what Isaiah saw was Jesus. That is His glory. The prophet Daniel saw the glory of the Son of God in his vision, Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man. It looked like a a human being, a glorious human being, one like the Son of Man was coming, and He came up to the Ancient of Days as as if He approached the Father, and He was presented before Him, and to Him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the people's nations and men of every language might serve Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. What are those things? Those are the perfections of Jesus. They show His glory, His dominion, His rule, His power. They show His glory. The New Testament gives us an even brighter picture of the glory of Jesus than what we could ever see in the Old Testament. John the Apostle says in John 1.14, and the Word became flesh. What is he referring to there? John 1.1, the Word was always with God, right? Because the Word was God. And now the Word became flesh. And listen to what John says. The Word dwelt among us. This is referring to Christ in His humanity. The Word dwelt among us, and we saw His what? We saw His glory. How did they see His glory? The way He lived on the earth displaying perfect humanity as the perfect bearing of the image of God, exactly what God intended humanity to be from day one, He showed through all His perfections glory. That's what John is referring to. We saw that glory those perfections in Him. And how did we see them? Well, you saw the perfections of Christ in His authority, His authority over the earth. He could, with a word, calm raging storms. He could command the earth, and it actually obeyed Him. He had authority over the demonic world to simply, with a word, cast a demon or multitudes of demons out of a person and assign them into eternal chains. That's incredible authority. That's the authority, the perfections of the Son of Man. You saw His ability to restore human beings from illness and disability and even death, showing glimpses of taking marred humanity and displaying God's image perfectly with no more effects of sin. He had that ability. We saw His glory. You also saw it in His character. Are you not mesmerized by the character of Jesus? What would drive us crazy, He just calmly responds to. What would bring out anger and rage in us, He shows compassion and kindness. He's perfect in His devotion to the Father, in His care for people, His patience, His rebukes for sin his encouragement, and on and on you could go about the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. You keep looking at Him, and you see that. And John says, these, these things that we saw, that was His glory in His incarnation as He displayed the image of God that we're intended to show. Three of His disciples got to see the splendor and the brilliance of Jesus' glory, didn't they? In Matthew chapter 17, verse 1, when they saw Him transfigured, when Jesus led them up on a high mountain, Matthew 17, He was transfigured before them, and His face shone like the sun, and His garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them, and Peter starts babbling something doesn't really know what he's talking about. What are they seeing? The brilliant glory of the perfections of Christ, of what he'll look like when he comes in his kingdom. 
The Apostle John got to see this in a very upfront way in the book of Revelation, in that mysterious description of it, Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. Don't you long for that day when your voice sounds like that? Your children would obey if you had that. And that voice said, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, which we know are references because the book tells us they're references to the churches, I saw one like a son of man. That's a reference to Daniel chapter 7, by the way. It's the son of man, a human being, the ultimate expression of humanity, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. And his head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire, and his feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. And in his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. What did he see? The glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. John describes it even further in the book of Revelation in chapter 19. In verse 11, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen and white and clean, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What is that a depiction of? The glory of of our Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Colossians describes Christ in his glory. In one of the best Christological pictures you'll find of the nature of Jesus, you'll see it in Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. What is that describing? the perfections of Jesus, the display of the perfections of Jesus. That is His glory. Or as Hebrews 1.3 says, He is the radiance of the Father's glory and the exact representation of His nature, and He upholds all things by the word of His power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. What is that a description of? That's the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. The full display of all that makes Jesus the complete and perfect image of God, the brilliance of his perfections put on display in his glory, in his humanity. That full display of Jesus' glory is going to be expressed fully and appreciated and completely enjoyed 
when he comes and we are with him. That is an incredible picture of Christ, isn't it? But Paul did not say in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14, that we would merely see the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, did he? What did he say? We will gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. As profound as it is of all that we just said about the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, has it hit you what Paul says here? We will gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That brings me to a question to ask here, a second question, not just what is the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ referring to. I think that's fairly easy for us to see, but what does it mean to gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ? What does it mean to gain the glory? Well, the word gain is used five times in the New Testament. One of the most interesting ones to look at that parallels this is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 9. It's a similar context. First Thessalonians 5, 9 says, for God has not destined us for wrath. God has not destined us for the day of the Lord to go through the time of His wrath, but what has He destined us for? For obtaining, that's the same word as gain, obtaining to gain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. What does salvation bring us? It brings us the gaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has destined us to obtain it, to possess it, to have it as if it were our own. It's one thing to buy a home. You ever bought a new home? It's pretty exciting. It's a whole new day when you possess it, right? Right? I mean, buying a home, they say it's one of the most stressful things you'll do in your marriage if you do it together with your spouse. And you know why. You feel like you've signed a ream of paper which intimidates you, and you wonder, what did I just sign my life away into, right? And then you walk into it, and it's yours, and it's new, unless you buy one of those fixer-uppers, and that doesn't fit the image whatsoever here. <laughs> No, those new houses, you, it smells different. That new car you buy, you know what it is to possess it. That's the idea. You possess the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the New Testament doesn't ever suggest that we become deity. It's not suggesting that we take on deity. But remember, the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ was not just the display of His deity, it was the display of his perfections in his humanity. That's what John saw when we saw the incarnated word and we beheld his glory. It's not just a description. We saw his deity, though they knew that he was God, but in his incarnation we saw his glory, his perfections in his humanity. And that's what we gain. We don't gain deity. We gain or I guess you could say we regain what God intended us to have from the very beginning when he created us in the image of God. And you understand, salvation is the process of restoring you to the image of God that we were intended to be from the beginning. That's what Colossians 3.10 says. We put on the new self, the saved self, who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. The image was marred. Salvation restores that. To what? The image we were created to bear, God's image. What is involved in that? Let me lay that out. What's involved in gaining the glory of Christ? Let me give you a few suggestions. In a word, it is transformation. Transformation. Transformation in what? What's well, transformation physically? I listen to Christians talk many times, and they act as if the goal of their Christianity is to somehow exist as a spirit in heaven. 
That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? When we die, we are instantly present with the Lord spiritually. But that is not the goal. The goal is physical transformation, living on this earth under the rule of Christ completed, which is exactly what 1 Corinthians chapter 15 describes in the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 42, so is the resurrection of the dead. Our bodies are sown a perishable body, but it will be raised in the resurrection, what? Imperishable incapable of knowing any decay or destruction. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. That doesn't mean that it's non-physical. It means it doesn't end, knows no limits. You remember these words of the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, 50, Now, I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. What does that mean? You, as you exist right now in your fallen humanity, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The perishable cannot inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. We will not all die. But we will all be what? That's a word that means transformed, change. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised. Imperishable will be changed. This perishable must put on the imperishable. This mortal must put on immortality. Gaining the Lord Jesus Christ and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ means we gain a transformed body that lives forever like His. It also is a moral transformation. You're not just transformed physically, but internally, your morality changes completely. Listen to Colossians 3.12. You remember Colossians 3.10, you're created in this new self who's being renewed in the true knowledge to the image of the one who created him. What does that image look like? So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also you should forgive. All of those internal qualities, those moral qualities are perfected. What a glory it will be to interact with people who are always kind and always compassionate, and always patient. I can't imagine a world that doesn't require anything but patience, right? It's a moral transformation. There's also a relational transformation. You remember the discussion that Jesus got into with the Sadducees when they questioned the resurrection, the future resurrection? And they give him this scenario of a woman who had been married to seven husbands in the resurrection, whose husband will she be? And and he says, you just don't understand anything about eternity. And he made this curious statement, Matthew 22, 29, you're mistaken, not understanding the scriptures or the power of God. In the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. And I know some people are like, bummer, no marriage? What does that mean? Well, there'll still be order and responsibilities in the resurrection because the angels have order and responsibilities and they serve the Lord. But there is no procreating in eternity. There's no need to spread the image of God because the image of God is complete and it's perfect. So every relationship that you have is better than the most intimate relationship you ever had on earth. It's complete relational transformation. It's transformation. It's also restoration. That's what we mean by gaining the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's restoration, where the curse of sin is removed from the earth and our humanity and the entire world functions as a complete, redeemed, God-centered, Christ-exalting people. Revelation 22, verse 1, talking about the eternal state the time when, the, when heaven and earth are joined as one. 
It says, he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. What does that refer to? It, it takes you all the way back to Genesis chapter 10 and 11, where the nations were actually opposed to God, and God ripped them apart and spread them across the earth. In the eternal state, there will be nations that spread across the earth, and they will all live in complete harmony and unity with each other under the fear of God. The nations will be healed. And it says, there will no longer be any curse. And the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, not apart from us, but with us. His bondservants will serve him and they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. And there's no longer any night. No, will not have need of the light of the lamp nor the light of the sun because the Lord God will illumine them. That is complete restoration, isn't it? That's what it means to gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, living in a world of complete restoration. It also means authority. It's what gaining the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ means. It means authority. You say, what do you mean by authority? Well, think again back to the book of Genesis. When God created humanity and He said, let us make man, Genesis 1, 26, in our image, according to our likeness, what is the next thing he said that his image and his likeness would then do? Let them rule. Let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and do what with it? Subdue it. In the beginning, bearing the image of God and the likeness of God, having the glory of God as yours meant that humanity would govern and rule the earth. When we gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, we rule over the earth with Him. Revelation 2.26 he who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken, broken to pieces, pieces as, as I also, also have received, received authority from, from my Father. What, what are we, we going to do? We're going to rule with Christ when he comes. Revelation 3.21, he who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. Why? This is what God created humanity to do in the beginning, to rule. When those who had died through the tribulation are raised from the dead, Revelation 20, verse 4, this says they come to life and they reign with Christ for a thousand years. Revelation 22, verse 5, the saints will reign forever and ever. That is what it means to gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Humanity takes up its rightful place to rule over the earth again. Another thing it means is eternality. This is what it means to gain the glory of Jesus. Eternality. What does that mean? We never die. Revelation 2, 7, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life. What does that mean? What was Adam and Eve barred from once they had sinned? From taking of the fruit of the tree of life. What entered in when sin entered in? Death. When we go into eternity, we'll eat from the tree of life forever. There'll be no, no end. It's an eternal life. Revelation 2.11, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death, meaning there is no death to fear. It's removed. We live forever. It's completion, restoration. Whatever it means to reflect the character of Jesus in His perfect and glorified humanity is what we will do. 
It's 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, we, now we are the children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. Isn't that profound? You will gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 3, 4, when Christ who is our life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. To gain the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ is to obtain and possess all of the perfections of the completed humanity of Christ and display it without sin in total God-centeredness. That, my friends, is the complete opposite of what you see in the day of the Lord, the day of wrath. He called you to gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, not to go through the wrath of God. Do you see how safe salvation is? That is your eternal destiny if you're in Christ. If you're not in Christ, the day of the Lord is yours. Now listen, the day of the Lord ends with the return of the glorified Christ with His glorified saints. It ends in glory, but the day of the Lord as it's expressed throughout the Bible is a period of wrath. It's not what we're destined for. It's not what He called us to, salvation. If you're in Christ, that's guaranteed. Salvation guarantees God's goal. Let's finish this morning with one final effect of salvation, safety from God's wrath. Last, number six, salvation safety motivates adherence to God's Word. What do you do if you know all of this to be true? You know how the events of the end are going to work out? You know the signs that show when the day of the Lord is here, so you're not misinterpreting your current circumstances. You know the safety of your salvation. What does that cause you to do now? Adhere to God's Word. Adhere to God's Word. Do you see that? Look at verse 15. So then, brethren, this is like summing up everything in the chapter. In light of everything that I've been saying from the beginning of the chapter, how the gathering relates to the day of the Lord, how the day of the Lord ends in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the appearing of Christ, in light of all the evidence that you're not in the day of the Lord, in light of the reality of the safety of your salvation, what should you do? Real simple. Stand firm and hold to. Those two phrases go together. In fact, they can't, they can't be separated. They go together grammatically. They're connected to one another. You stand firm by holding on to. You hold on to, and it causes you to stand firm. The way you gain clarity about all the current events in light of the future is by standing firm and holding on to something. And what is that? He says, hold on to the traditions which you were taught. Now, before we get into what he means by that, look at that word, hold on. It's a very strong word. It's almost a violent word. When you say violent, yes, other times, especially in the Gospels, it's translated as seize or arrest. It has some strong force behind it seize and grab hold of this. <laughs> if your child fell off a cliff and you grabbed their arm and you knew the only thing saving them from being dashed to pieces at the bottom of the cliff was your grip, would you hold on? What would that feel like? That's the hold on he's referring to. You hold on like it's everything in your body is saying you cannot let go of this. You seize it, and you don't let go of it. To what? The traditions that you were taught. Now, don't think of traditions in the common American way we often talk about traditions. You have traditions at Christmas, and I know those are almost Scripture-like for some of you. 
but they're not. They shouldn't be. You're not violating anything in, in righteousness by just, you know, your, your particular calendar you liked at the 12 days or whatever it is. You have, you have your traditions. You have certain meals. You have, th- that is not what he's referring to here. That, this word has far more weight than just something that you have done over and over. What does Paul have in mind when he mentions traditions? Well, the word is used a number of times in the gospel accounts to refer to the traditions of men or the traditions of the elders of the Jews. And you know what he's referring to there. The traditions of the Jews, Jewish rabbis had written commentaries on all of the Old Testament law, and many of those commentaries under the names of those rabbis had become the traditions. For example, It became the tradition of the elders that how would you apply the rule of the Sabbath day to not break the Sabbath day? Well, the rabbis would say, well, that means that you can't walk any further than about 2,000 cubits, which is a half mile or so, maybe a little more than a half mile, on the Sabbath day. And if you, you go any further than about a half mile, you've broken the Sabbath. And that tradition was elevated to the same authority as the Sabbath rule that's found in the Ten Commandments. And there were times where Jesus had to say, so you're upset with my disciples because they don't wash their hands. That was a rule, an application of a biblical truth, but the application became the standard. That was the tradition. He says, you're invalidating the Word of God by your tradition. So the traditions were things that men had made up. Is that what Paul is referring to here by hold on to the traditions? Not likely. When Paul uses this word and he talks about traditions, they always are linked to what he revealed as truth. 1 Corinthians 11, 2. Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and you hold firmly to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, we command you, brethren, in in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you received from us. The tradition he's talking about is not the commentary of pastors and theologians. It's not even like in Roman Catholicism, they've actually taken, they develop a whole series of law called canon law, and they raise their traditions, whatever the Pope speaks or the bishops collectively speak together, or the Pope speaks ex cathedra from the chair authoritatively becomes equal to and binding, just as binding as Scripture. It's not the idea here. What Paul revealed in his apostolic authority as he's unveiling the mystery that then begins to be passed on and taught to you, this is the tradition. What he means by the tradition is biblical truth. Well, we're Baptists, so we, we don't have a problem with that, right? Oh, yes, we do. Because biblical truth for us oftentimes is boring. We need something exciting. We need something new. We need something fresh. And we need something practical because the Bible oftentimes is not practical enough. And haven't you read the latest material on productivity? And how helpful it is? And if you obey this, then you're being a good steward, we're told. And it's almost the signs of productivity written in the latest guru's book is almost elevated as the way to be a good steward over your time. Or any other issue. Health. The so-called wellness industry. Oils. Financial plans parenting techniques, all claiming biblical authority, and the key to a truly unlocking the true spiritual life, many of those are simply redefining righteousness. You say redefining righteousness, that's right. You redefine righteousness because you think by giving yourself to this, you're being spiritual. And you find some personal temporary benefit in it, but if you become entrenched in the system that's not explicitly tied to the intended meaning of the Scriptures, you get entrenched in the system and you can't think outside of the system. And anytime you go outside the system, you feel guilty 
and you feel like you're disobeying God because you're not in the system anymore. You know what that leads to? It's, it's nothing different than the Thessalonians. Some authority is saying, go this way, and you say, oh, I better go that way. Some authority who writes a book says, this study show, and you say, oh, this has to be how to, how to be a good steward, so I go that way, and I can't live outside of this. Something other than the Word of God has become an authority to you, and you have elevated something to a standard equal to God's Word. You know what that creates? A shaken life. A shaken life. Your spirituality is tied to a system that's not tied to correctly interpreted Scripture, and you'll become oppressive. It'll leave you spiritually weak. You'll be suspect of others. You'll be unloving towards those who don't adopt the system. You're easily shaken by anything that disturbs the system other than the Word of God. The Bible, correctly understood by its own intention, is what we're to cling to with all our might. And it is right to be discerning and evaluate what we're saying we live by. Listen, the Bible is written so that we're sure-footed. Have you ever noticed how many times the Bible talks about your feet being firmly planted? Well, what plants the feet firmly? No other source other than the God-breathed revelation of Scripture does that. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my… Why does he say that? So you can be sure-footed, stable, stand firm. You remember the Apostle Paul said, there's, there's terrible times that are coming. Men will be lovers of self, money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irre irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Those days are coming. How do you overcome that? That Second Timothy 3, at the end of that chapter, he says, all Scripture is breathed out by God. And it's profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God is adequate, thoroughly equipped for every good work. How are we going to respond to this world? The Bible. Trust it. What's happening to the Thessalonians in their circum? They're looking around. How do we deal with all this? We need to retreat. That's what we're going to see in chapter 3. Some people are retreating from society and even getting out of the church to enclose themselves by themselves because of everything they're seeing in their culture. That's a sure sign you're not trusting the Scriptures. You're not stable. It's weakness. It's shaken. It's agitated. Not stable. Holding on to. This is dire for us. The days will become more terrible to shake us, to agitate us. What will you hold to? With all your might, like if you let go, all is lost. You better hold to the Scriptures. Not to one pastor, to the Bible itself, to the degree that any pastor is rightly con interpreting the Bible, you hold to what is said there. This is the safety of our salvation, too. What keeps you safe? God's Word does. There isn't another source. There isn't another method. There isn't another means. It is the truth that keeps you safe. And if you're safe, you should be encouraged. And we'll look at that when we return to it next week for the final response to this chapter. Let's close with a word of prayer. And just bow for a moment of silence before the Lord and think about how your own heart should respond to God's Word. Father, thank You for such a great salvation. A salvation that doesn't just give us 
the hope of some future without opposition, but a salvation that gives us the hope of obtaining the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for the truth. Thank you for what you've said so clearly, so capably, so adequately that gives us clarity about life and liberty in our life. Thank you for saving us from the wrath to come. I pray for those who, if that coming were initiated today, they would be the objects of your wrath, and I pray that you would turn their hearts to see Christ and the glory that awaits, and they would leave behind their sin because of something more valuable the person of Jesus. Give them confidence in the work that Christ has done on the cross, how he's paid for sin to restore us to the image of God we were created to bear. Help us to live, Father, as if we are safe from your wrath in a way that settles and stabilizes our soul, trusting in what we see in the Scriptures alone. Forgive us when we elevate other authorities to the same authority as we find in the Word that leads us to unstable lives, confusion, and a lack of holiness. Help us so that we're not fearful, we're not reactionary, we're not unstable, we're not anxious, we're not worried. We're confident, stable, believing. Lord, do this work in us which you alone can. Make us, finish us into the image of your Son so that we gain his glory as you intend. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.